Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 9.3 on potential energy diagrams. Uh, potential energy diagrams are a really big deal in intro level chemistry. So in your outline and objectives, I'd put a star next to this one. This is one that you really need to be on top of. And most of it just comes down to some terminology and interpreting these PE diagrams. So today we're going to focus on what information can be obtained from a potential energy diagram and then using that diagram to solve problems regarding that reaction. Um, so just quick review, uh, system and surroundings are two terms that you were introduced to in the last lesson. The system is the actual reaction or change that's being studied. The surroundings are everything else, and that includes the reaction vessel. So I don't want to take too much more time to talk about that as it is review. Um, so it was mentioned before, the system is really, really difficult to study directly. So as a result, we tend to study the surroundings and then work backwards or deduce what must have happened to the system. And that's because of the first law of thermodynamics, that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change form. Uh, so if the surroundings gain energy, that must be because the system lost it. Or if the surroundings lose energy, it must be because the system gained it. There is no third option where that energy can come from. All right, so let's get into PE diagrams. Uh, this is a potential energy diagram. Sometimes on the x-axis you will see time. It's going to let me write on this today. There we go. Uh, whether it's time or reaction coordinate, reaction coordinate, you can think of it as just the progress of the reaction. Doesn't really matter in this case. They're both just looking at how the reaction progresses. Uh, sometimes you'll see energy on the y-axis. Sometimes it's a little bit more specific. And you'll see PE. Either way, perfectly fine. Uh, we always start with our reactants on the left side. And we kind of go through this like little hill. And we get to our products on the right side. So the first thing I want to talk about is activation energy. And activation energy is this arrow right here. Look at those fancy PowerPoint skills. Uh, activation energy is the energy required to start a reaction. Every single reaction, regardless of what it is, uh, requires activation energy. Nothing happens just purely spontaneously. Things aren't going to burst into flames, for example. There has to be some energy provided. Uh, I like to look at the potential energy diagram as a roller coaster. Hopefully you've had the chance to ride roller coasters before. They are so much fun. Um, if you've been on a roller coaster before and you think back to it, uh, how does nearly every single roller coaster start? Uh, all the ones that I've been on start by getting dragged up some gigantic hill. Uh, this is usually the longest part of the, or I should say like the single longest part of the entire ride. You're in your like little roller coaster car and you need a chain to drag you up to the top of the hill. So it requires energy to move the roller coaster cars to the top of the hill, just like it requires energy to get the reaction started. Our activation energy is always energy in. Uh, so this is going to take a long time to get you to the top of the hill on a roller coaster. And this is also what we call our rate determining step in chemistry, meaning it's going to be the slowest step of the reaction. You have to provide energy to get the reaction reactants to react. Uh, so again, activation energy is always positive. That's because as activation energy is provided, we are breaking bonds. And breaking bonds is an energy intensive process. You must put energy in to break a bond. At the top of the hill, we have the transition state. Uh, to go back to our roller coaster analogy, when you are sitting at the top of that hill on the roller coaster, what do you feel like? What's going through your mind? Chances are this is when your heart is racing. Yeah, you might start to question, why did I get on this in the first place? I'm nervous, I'm excited, I'm anxious, a whole lot of emotions, but this is a really high energy state for you. This is the same thing for the reactants. The transition state is the highest or most energetic point in our entire potential energy diagram. Um, at this point, the reactants have their bonds broken, but the bonds for the products haven't formed yet. So this is extremely high energy and very unstable. Uh, it's impossible to really stop the reaction at this point and isolate the transition state. Just like once the roller coaster gets going, you're up at the top and that first car starts to like you know, get past the top of the roller coaster, the top of the hill, and it's on its way down, pretty much nothing's going to stop it. Now you've got gravity working, and you're not going to be able to put an end to that. 
Uh, so again, this is where the bonds have broken and the reactants, but they haven't formed yet for the products. So the transition state sticks around for just an instant. And if you think about yourself on the roller coaster, usually you don't spend very long at that highest point on the roller coaster. It's kind of just you're passing through. Um, same idea with the transition state. Up next, we've got change in enthalpy, which is also called delta H. Uh, we'll talk more in future lessons about what enthalpy is exactly. For the time being, think about it just as energy. There's a mole component to it, but again, that's for a future lesson. Uh, delta H is what we call the heat of the reaction. So it's the amount of energy that's either absorbed or released. Delta H can be positive or negative. And we always solve for delta H using products minus reactants. Um, now we don't have any numbers on this potential energy diagram, but I bet we can figure out whether the delta H or the change in enthalpy for this reaction is going to be positive or negative. In this case, I've got my reactants right here. It's always going to be to the left and my products will always be to the right. If I take the value of my products and I subtract the value or the energy, I should say at this point, okay, stay away from enthalpy of the reactants. Hopefully you recognize that products have less energy than the reactants. So a small number minus a big number. In this case, we'd get a negative value for Delta H and that means something that's important. We'll talk more about signs uh, and their meaning for enthalpy momentarily. Okay, uh, if you take a look at your workbook, you'll see that there are two potential energy diagrams provided, and they look strikingly similar, but there are a couple key differences. So I'm looking at the one on the left, our exothermic reaction potential energy diagram. Exothermic, the prefix exo means out, uh, therm we know means heat. So these are reactions that push heat out or release energy. Um, in this case, our products have less energy than the reactants, so we're going to see a negative delta H value. So we just talked about how to calculate delta H. Delta H is always equal to products minus reactants. In this case, we've got a small number for the products, a larger number for the reactants. So we're going to see a negative value of delta H. If the system or the reaction is giving off heat, what's going to happen to the temperature of the surroundings? Hopefully you can deduce that the temperature is going to increase as far as the surroundings are concerned. Uh, so when delta H is negative, that means that the products have less energy than the reactants. So energy has been released and that is observed by observing the surroundings and seeing that the surroundings have gotten hotter. If we look at this kind of like portion of a chemical equation, really, really generic, we've got A plus B yields AB. Um, now that we're doing thermochemistry, we can add the heat term in or energy. Since energy has been released, does that sound like heat or energy should go on the reactant side or the product side? Well, heat has been released overall, so I'm going to add heat to the product side. Um, we'll worry about exactly what that number should be. Um, usually we don't write just plus heat or plus energy. We uh, specify how many kilojoules of energy have been released different lesson. Okay, so to recap, exothermic heat goes out. Uh, these are going to be reactions that release energy. So heat will be a product and we'll see a negative delta H and the temperature of the surroundings increase. Endothermic reactions are 180 degrees the opposite. Endo, that prefix means in. Therm, again, is talking about heat. So these are going to be chemical or physical changes where heat is being absorbed. In this case, the products have more energy than the reactants. So I have a larger number minus a smaller number. So I end up with a positive delta H. And if we look at um, what's going to happen to the surroundings, as we go from reactants to products, we're absorbing energy. The system, I should say, is absorbing energy. Well, where is that energy coming from? It has to come from the surroundings. Uh, so what's going to happen to the temperature of the surroundings as an endothermic reaction occurs? Since the system is absorbing energy, it's going to take it from the surroundings. So we're going to observe a decrease in temperature of the surroundings. And if we go back to our partial equation, might be kind of um, predisposed to knowing which side it goes on. 
based on how it's formatted, but because heat is absorbed, heat is going to be a reactant in this case. And again, the amount of kilojoules not too important at this point in time. Just know that endothermic reactions absorb heat. The products are going to have more energy than the reactants. Therefore, delta H will be positive. And we'll know that an endothermic reaction is occurring because you have the temperature of the surroundings decreasing. So just a couple examples, um, something like lighting paper on fire, burning paper. Would you think that's going to be exo or endothermic? Uh, based on your experiences, hopefully you know that's exothermic. Things that are combusting release heat, so release energy. So combustion is a good example of an exothermic reaction. Um, if you've ever used a chemical ice bag before, it kind of sounds like there's like a bunch of crystals in that plastic bag, and there's like this bubble thing that you need to pop. Um, in reality, you have pretty sure it's ammonium chloride in the bag, and that bubble thing is just filled with water. And as ammonium chloride, NH4Cl, dissolves, it does so endothermically. So what does that mean is going to happen to the temperature of the surroundings? Well, it's an ice bag. Things are going to get colder. Uh, so that's our endothermic reaction. Um, I don't want to do the 60-second summary just yet. Let's look at a couple of practice problems. We'll head over to your notebook. All right, now we're into the practice problems, and I'm going to look at this first potential energy diagram over here. Uh, so this one, let's uh, take a look at it. We've got, you know, reactants over here, products over here. You now we hopefully are going to be familiarized with the PE diagram. All right, so question 1A, which letter represents the PE of the products? Well, I know that this is the PE, uh, the product side over here going to write that products um, so okay letter F represents the potential energy of the products uh, the potential energy of the activated complex also known as the transition state now the transition state is the point on the PE diagram that is highest in energy so that's going to be represented by letter D the potential energy of the reactants reactants are right over here not sure how well you can read that. Sorry, it's kind of sloppy. Uh, so the potential energy of the reactants is going to be B. The activation energy of the forward reaction. Okay, so if we're moving in the forward direction, so from reactants to products, uh, the activation energy, that's the energy required to get to the transition state, it looks like that's going to be letter A for our forward reaction. Uh, the heat of the reaction for the forward reaction. Now, the heat of the reaction is delta H. And that's always equal to products minus reactants. So I've got F is my products. Uh, B is my reactants. So the difference between F and B looks like it's going to be C. If we look at the activation of the reverse reaction, so in our reverse reaction, we're going from products over to reactants. Um, so it's from products to the top of the hill, the highest point of the PE diagram. So the activation energy of the reverse reaction looks like it's going to be E. The heat of the reaction of the reverse reaction. So we end up with delta H is equal to products minus reactants. Uh, remember, we're going in the opposite direction now, so it's kind of like reactants minus products. Uh, but we look at B, we look at F, oh, it's C again. And that is not coincidental. And the reaction is forward, uh, exothermic in the forward, it's going to be endothermic in the reverse, and the delta H value will not change, only the sign of delta H will. Uh, and finally, is the forward reaction exo or endothermic? Well, let's see. The reactants have more energy than the products. That must mean that energy was lost. Uh, when energy is lost, we have an exothermic reaction. Energy is lost. Uh, energy of the products is less, oops, wrong way less than energy of the reactants. That is definitely not the best handwriting ever. Sorry about that. Uh, if you want to start putting some numbers to these calculations, not a bad idea. Um, the next potential energy diagram gives you a chance to practice with that. And finally, those last three questions have you performing some other calculations and drawing your own PE diagrams. So really increasing in difficulty as you make your way down the page. Okay. 
Um, so that pretty much wraps it up for today's lesson. Familiarize yourself with potential energy diagrams. Know where the transition state or activated complex is. Know how to calculate delta H. Know whether it's exo or endo and what the sign of delta H should be. All of those are really important. And we're going to, you know, I've said it a bunch this unit already, we're going to build on that in future lessons as we start to actually calculate delta H instead of just looking at whether it's going to be positive or negative. All right, that wraps it up for today. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you found this helpful.